Um, I'd like to start at the start and lay a bit of groundwork so that we all know where the politicians stand. Um, and I'd like to start with something that is right in front of us right now. Uh, can you all tell me, in turn, please, will you support Julianne Genter's medicinal cannabis bill? Yep. Hand, you may as well hands up. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bishop, why not? We, everyone hear me? Yep, good. We haven't talked about it as a caucus yet. In fact, we haven't even made a decision as to whether or not it will be a conscience vote. Um, it's one of those issues where we do want to have a good discussion about it as a caucus. We may decide to have it as a, a conscience vote where MPs can vote individually. Uh, we may also decide to have it as a, a party vote where the National Party takes a, a party position. Um, so we haven't had that process-based discussion. We also haven't had the substantive discussion. So um, I, can't, I can't tell you what our stance on it is yet because uh, I don't get to make the policy for the caucus. Uh, we have a discussion about it. <laughs> there, are four, um, there are four party leaders up here. I think me and David are the... Uh, the old one's out. <laughs> Mr Bishop, if it is a conscience vote, will you vote for it? Uh, well, I, I, haven't, um, I haven't made up my mind on that one yet. I mean, I, um, I'm very sympathetic to the aims of the bill, um, and, but I think Julianne herself accepts that it has some, some flaws uh, and some workability issues. I think she herself says that. Uh, so, yeah, I, well, I think the, the rule was no interruptions, but okay. Um, <laughs> So, and I'd and I to make the point, Ross, that there's a, a very uh, reasonable argument that those issues should be sorted out at select committee. Um, but I'm very sympathetic to it, but I haven't made up my mind yet. Correct me, if I could just stay with you for a moment, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel as though you might not personally agree with your party's strong opposition to reform, am I right? Um, I, I don't know about that. I mean, what, what do you mean by our party's strong opposition to reform? I mean, it's uh, this government with Peter Dunn um, as our confidence and supply partner, who's our uh, associate minister of health, who's uh, we passed the Psychoactive Substances Act. Uh, Peter can talk to you about that. We have um, we're moving towards a, a tr uh, moving towards a policy where we regard drugs as a primarily a health issue and a harm minimisation issue rather than a criminal justice issue. That's in the national drug uh, policy, which uh, Peter's championed and which is the policy of the government. So uh, I don't I don't really understand your remark. Okay. All right, let's uh, explore Well that done. Bit. You're a very good politician. <laughs> let's Just have another hands-up situation. Just like do, it is. do you all agree that prohibition is not working? Hands up, if yes. you agree. Right. Okay. So further to that, do you all support some kind of law reform? Yep. Hands up? Right. Okay. So Alison Ritter showed us an infographic that depicted a line. It started at one end with full prohibition and moved through depenalisation, decriminalisation, legalisation of use and possession uh, to full legalisation. Where do each of you sit on that line and why? And if I could start with Meteria and move back this way. Kia ora koutou katoa e mihi aroha kia koutou. I'm really pleased to be able to be talking about this issue in such a great forum. The Green Party supports for cannabis, the legalisation of cannabis. Uh, New Zealanders, adults, should be free to grow their pot, to consume their pot and to share it with their friends. Um, it is effectively making legal now what people do now every day. Uh, we are fully in favour of medicinal cannabis. It may be the first step or it may be an addition to legalisation. In terms of other drugs, we think there is a different process that can be gone through with other drugs. But it is about time that we took the step and legalised cannabis. We have been talking about this issue in Parliament since Nandal Tanksos brought the Health Select Committee inquiry into cannabis law in 2003. We're talking about the same issues now we were talking about in 2003. Let's move on from there, now. Kia ora. So, full legalisation, I think we can put you at. Right. Chris. Yeah, so I, th I think one of, the, one of the issues that comes up once you start talking about medicinal uh, marijuana, which has been, which has been brought up by, by Julianne's bill for the Greens, is you very quickly move to a conversation around the, the legal status of, of marijuana, right? And actually, Materia herself just sort of essentially conflated the two um, because it's, it's very difficult to have a conversation around uh, where you get the supply of medicinal marijuana before you 
very quickly start talking about overall supply, and then you get into issues of should it be a government mandated supply, should it be a government monopoly, uh, should the government license growers, which is I suppose the next step beyond a government monopoly and things like that. Um, we've got the opportunity to have all of those sort of discussions uh, in the context of the Misuse of Drugs Act review, which um, again the National Drug Policy says will happen uh, in the next couple of years, and I note Peter said in his uh, opening remarks this morning he's hope hoping to get on with um, after the election, and obviously the complexion of Parliament may be completely different after the election, the complexion of the Ministry may be completely different as well, but there is a scheduled review of the Misuse of Drugs Act, and I'm really looking forward to taking part in that conversation. Um, I've been to Colorado, I was on a State Department trip uh, to uh, Colorado, not, not just to look at um, medicinal marijuana, but um, to do other things as well. Uh, but I took the opportunity to go and talk to the people who've been involved in law reform uh, there, uh, go and talk to people who own dispensaries, go and talk to the people who are involved in the law reform uh, movement. And that there. led you to place yourself where on the line? Well, I found, I, I found, it, I found it really interesting, and I think, I think there are some lessons we can take from that experience. Um, but I think the evidence is not yet in on it, and actually they made that point to me over there, the people I talked to made the point. The evidence is not yet clear about uh, whether or not youth usage goes up or down, for example, and everyone tends to agree that we want 18-year-olds and below, not well, people 18 and under, to, uh, to not use marijuana. Uh, so the evidence is not yet in on that. Now, that was 18 months ago. The evidence may have moved on from that, but that's my understanding. On okay, David. Uh, look, I, I, I start from the view that it's all or nothing. I think uh, decriminalisation is the worst of all worlds, and if you're a parent, uh, you're sitting there saying, do you want to have a legalised demand side, meaning it's not criminal to use it, uh, but keep the supply side basically with criminal elements. And I think that's the worst of all worlds. It's probably worse than what we've got now. Um, so it's all or nothing, but I also echo what Chris is saying, that I think our friends in California and Colorado, um, Canada, all places starting with C that have similar histories and cultures to ours, are giving us a huge opportunity to observe some of the unknown questions and also for the public to observe it because right now uh, the facts are that 80% of New Zealanders oppose full legalisation. There's a spectrum of opinion on different options in between um, but I think the opportunity is to observe what our friends around the world experience and answer some of those unknowns and anxieties that a lot of people have. Thank you. Marama. Kia ora, um, nei te mehi atu ki a koutou ko hui nei uh, kei daru i te tūnui o tēnei o tātou whare, kia ora. Um, I think as a party, we are clear that we support medicinal uh, marijuana and that, that it should be legal and, and available. We also support decriminalisation, so looking at it as a health issue. We haven't moved all the way to supporting legalisation. Um, though we're very open to the conversation about it, and it is an evolving conversation. Well, <laughs> a little bit of capitalism will get us there, but the, the conversation does need to be had because we see the effects in our communities and um, hardest hit uh, Māori and Pacifica. Uh, they're also um, criminalised more often because of it, um, uh, disproportionately so and unjustly so. Uh, so I think we don't want to have our prisons full of um, our young people for a drug offence, a minor drug offence. Um, so we definitely want to have a conversation. When we talk about legalisation though, uh, we also see the harm of marijuana use in um, our communities. And it, if it can stem the tide of pee use, then we are fully open to that conversation. So I'm happy to be here. It's very interesting listening to your experiences in Canada and in the US. And uh, like David said, I'm, it, I think it provides us a perfect opportunity to have a look at the consequences and um, discuss what's right fit for New Zealand. I'm gonna put you down for decriminalisation then. Yes. You comfortable with that? David. Yeah, um, I sit with the radical far out extremist um, group, the Law Commission on this stuff, <laughs> um, and wherever they are on that line, I'm pretty much there. Um, their, their report in 2011, um, I think, suggested a pretty sensible, solid way forward, and um, we support putting their um, recommendations into action. That's, um, you know, 2011 report. It's been on the table a while. I think people have had a, a time to think about it, and we can get some feedback from there. 
Mm, that's interesting. I've observed, though, that this doesn't seem to be a particular priority for Labour in an election year, this election year. Why is that? Um, it, it, how do you mean? Um, well, every time we try to talk about it, we're directed to the admittedly, I'm talking about the media, the admittedly very important uh, subjects of housing, health, education. Um, nobody seems to want to talk about drug law reforms. Please, please media note, we are interested in health, housing and education as the Labour <laughs> Party and those are our priorities. We want, uh, we're making, we're being really clear this year that we are trying to get a clear message across to voters. We've been accused in the past of having every priority and therefore none. Uh, we're being really upfront about that. But um, I'm happy to talk to any media that want to talk to me about this. Um, we are unashamedly on the side of um, the kind of path to reform that the Law Commission sets out, and that is uh, in line with what several other members here have said, treating this as a health issue primarily and not Does a Does that mean decriminalisation or it means, it means following that path and having a conversation. I mean, I think they, they lay out a pretty clear path, and the, 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 the lady there laughs. Uh, it, it, it's a clear path, and I think it's a conversation we need to have as a society. It's not something that we impose upon people and expect people to behave a certain way. And, it, and I think it does lead down a road um, that has us uh, treating um, things in a, in a pragmatic way, acknowledging that drugs are there in our communities and that people use them. Um, and, that, you know, and that not all drugs are harm free, and that goes for legal ones too. We kind of heard where you stand, um, Peter. If, do you want to give us a brief Certainly. Um, Where you are on the line, and then I've got a couple of questions well, for I, I you. Just, I just really want to pick up um, points that Anne McClellan made, because the regulatory regime posed for Canada uh, is very similar to our Psychoactive Substances Act, so the issues about control and regulation and distribution and all of those things are dressed up uh, under that legislation, the restrictions about age and sale and so on. So it seems to me if you move to a regulated market where you have products that are, uh, have, have I won't go through the detail, but have met the test about the standard of manufacture, et cetera, et cetera, then the issue of whether they're criminal or not doesn't apply because you've got them being sold in a regulated environment in the same way that other products of a similar type are being sold, and you move on from there. Is it simpler for us to create change because we only have a central government, we don't have a state system? Alison Holcomb talked a bit about that. Um, I'm leading somewhere with this. Would you well, agree with the that? The short answer to that is yes. Okay. Um, That's why we so got rid of the provinces in 1876. Alison Holcomb told us not to be looking for a per uh, perfect solution and uh, Anne showed a solution can be found in four to five months. Why is the pace of change here so glac glacially slow? Well, if, we were, if the Psychoactive Substances Act was fully operational and if the change was made to transfer those Class C drugs, as I suggested, out of the Misuse of Drugs Act, that could happen pretty quickly. But there are two complications. The first is that um, when Parliament amended the Psychoactive Substances Act in 2014, it properly uh, ruled out animal testing as one of the tests, sets of tests to be applied to determine um, the level of risk. There needs to be an alternative to developed to that, and that's going to happen anyway because worldwide I think pressure is going to mount to abandon animal testing. Officials are currently looking at what those options might be. The second one is that I, th I think that all of these matters need to be considered in the context of the Misuse of Drugs Act because that's the overarching piece of legislation. That's going to take a little bit more time to tidy up because it's pretty ancient and uh, in need of major rewrite, and that will happen over the next couple of years. So I think that's the time frame that we could move in a couple if, of the, years. If, if there was the political will to do it. Now, I'm one voice in a government. I have, uh, I think, been able to make quite a lot of progress, but the, the major party of government, uh, in fact both major parties, have a somewhat more cautious view than some of the minor parties on these issues. Uh, I'm going to throw this out to all of you. What did each of you like most about the case studies we've heard about today uh, and the approaches that Canada and Washington in particular have taken? Jump in. I made notes. Um, I think the, the point that you made, um, uh, Anne, about the confusion of policing is absolutely prevalent in New Zealand. We have um, injustice in the justice system, and so, as I mentioned before, Māori and Pacifica are more harshly penalised um, for 
the same crime as others. Uh, and so if they've been arrested for these crimes and the variability depending on region and urban in New Zealand is exactly as you mentioned. Uh, so that is there. So we have an injustice based on uh, region and we also have an injustice based on ethnicity in this country around the policing of it. So if we're going to police it, then let's police it. I could not get a police officer to come to the school where I found out one young man was selling drugs at the school. <laughs> they, they didn't even want to talk to him. It's like, what do you got to do? And I just wanted him to be, uh, be aware of what his circumstances would be or what the, what, uh, the outcome would be for, for doing it. But I couldn't even get a cop to come. So anyway. Um, <laughs> I think also that um, the experts... You mentioned about get the experts on board because experts can hurt you if they don't agree with you or if we ignore their advice. Um, absolutely, if we're going to have the conversation, we need to have a range of expert opinion. Uh, and also um, talking to Indigenous governments or to Indigenous populations because there is a very strong opposition amongst um, Māori leadership uh, for... Um, legalising marijuana in this country because they see the harm of it. So the conversation needs to be widened and we need to be able to express freely um, where we think we're at. And so, yep. The argument I always hear is uh, for the young people, which I can totally understand, but we are starting to see, as we've heard from our speakers, that in each case, I think as Alison uh, Holcomb said, the sky has not fallen. When is enough evidence enough, just briefly? Um, I think, well, this is the thing. If we want to talk about the evidence, we can talk about all the wonderful things that happen. But, you know, I've got cousins who have, um, who are schizophrenic, uh, long-term drug users, cousins who have brain tumours, long-term drug users. Um, it, it's not harmless. And I think if we ignore that part of the conversation, then we're not being front up with ourselves. And so, I, I, yes, experts, but experts from the whole range. Um, Materia, yeah. what did you like? Um, what I, I liked, quite a few things. I liked that if the argument to take a rational and evidence-based approach to what drugs do for individuals and for communities, how they make people feel, what are the harms, what are the benefits? Because that requires us to put aside the old reefer madness, you know, like every drug user must be an addict and must have a problem and it's all just a big problem and bad. You know, drugs are bad, that attitude. And I think if we continue with that attitude at the beginning of new policy development, we will undo any potential good that we can in that policy. So if we truly take on, we will be act with rationality, we will take the evidence of our communities, we will take the scientific evidence, and we will build rational drug law that works for the best for our people. We're starting in a really good place. The second thing I'd say, I was really encouraged uh, by the, the um, emphasis on making sure we engage with people who are using drugs in the making of that policy. Because it's very easy, and I've been, I've been a, a cannabis law reform advocate now for 25 years. Uh, I've been in this job talking about this issue for the last 15. So I've seen all of the different permutations of what, um, how people feel about drugs. But the thing that almost never arises, except through the, through the foundation, frankly, is talking with people who use drugs about what it is that they need most because they are the ones who are penalised from prohibition and the criminal law. They, their families are the ones who suffer, and so they need to be part of the um, process of making the policy. So it's practical, so it makes sense for them and their families, as well as for the policy makers and the people who engage with health and addiction services, everybody else as well. But it's the, often the drug users who are the least engaged by us policy makers. Um, and <laughs> Um, and then I think I was encouraged too by um, the statement that it's as much a human rights issue as it is a health one, because it is, and that we have moved on eh, from, thank you, <laughs> from being a criminal issue to just a health issue to now recognising that it's a human rights one as well, and we have that that also leads to really good quality policy. It's a health issue. It's a human rights issue. We can do. A, 
I think I'm also really encouraged. We have this fantastic country here. We've got a huge amount of evidence about the patterns of drug use in New Zealand, what works, what doesn't in terms of policy, the harms, the racism that's involved in the law. You know, we know all of this stuff, so we have this great opportunity to create a new policy here that works for us and our people, that takes the best from the overseas examples that we've seen today and will develop over time. We might have a little chat about how we could go about that in just a sec, but um, David, did you want to have something to say about uh, what you heard this morning? What you particularly liked about it? Oh, look, I think what the Canadians did with their task force... Could you hold the microphone a bit closer? I think what the Canadians did with their task force was first class. Uh, They looked to learn from other jurisdictions. They found out things about edibles and you know, people blowing themselves up in Colorado that were useful things to know, uh, that that allowed the Coloradans to learn instead of them. And um, I think that we should take a similar approach. Um, You know, I I commend Materia for talking about it for 15 years, but we need to actually change some things. And I think one thing for the next government to do would be to replicate that um, and actually call the Royal Commission and say the express purpose is to study what has happened in Canada, Colorado, California, Portugal and other jurisdictions and say New Zealand wants to learn from that knowledge too. And that's something concrete that we could do in the next parliament uh, that would bring about the change that Materia uh, so loquaciously and passionately talks about. Anybody else on that? Can I make a point about the... Oh, sorry, Peter. Can I make a point about the the line about the evidence, uh, about the experts, sorry, that you can't do it without the experts, but you can't just do it with the experts. And I found that very strong, very powerful, because um, if you want rational evidence-based policy, which Materia was endorsing and I would agree with, and I'm sure Minister Dunn would agree with as well, you've got to do it based on what the experts say. But you also, you know, we live in a demo- we live in a, a deliberative parliamentary democracy where we don't have rule by experts, we don't have rule by the elite, we have rule by the people's representatives. Uh, And actually, there are some quite challenging and confronting political issues to deal with when it comes to these issues. And so we can't just do it on experts alone. You've got to take the public with you. And the experience of the Psychoactive Substances Act in 2014 demonstrates that that is difficult because there was a lot of moral panic around some of uh, the passing of that act in 2014. Uh, A lot of it driven by the media. I mean, I remember you know, Campbell Live and other media outlets, you know, campaigning, literally campaigning journalism outside, outside shops that were, were selling psychoactive substances that were licensed, and as we moved into that new regime, and there were attempts by, by various groups and by media to shut those things down. And a lot of, you know, huge, you know, moral outrage and panic. Uh, and so these are, my, my point is, I don't want to relitigate all that stuff. But my point is just that it's quite a politically challenging issue. And so it's not just about the experts, it's also about how you take the broader public with you, because we live in a democracy, and that's how you ultimately get policy change through. And Alison pointed out earlier in the day that governments need to act in ways the people want, I think it was Alison, uh, the New Zealand people want drug law reform, don't they? Do you accept that? Can I answer that question? Yes. Look, I still bear the scars from the psychoactive substances debacle of the healing, but the reality was, prior to the passage of that bill, when we went out there and said we're going to take these substances off the shelves and put them in place in an environment that regulates them, everyone said it's a really great idea because they were being sold over the counter at corner dairies without any control whatsoever, some 4,000 outlets, some 300-odd products. When the legislation was passed and we said there are going to be 150 or thereabouts regulated outlets in the country selling probably about 50 products, I think it was 41 initially, the public mood shifted from you're getting rid of them to now you've suddenly introduced these substances. I still get letters from people telling me I introduced psychoactive substances to New Zealand. No, I didn't. I actually got rid of them in many senses. So Chris is right about that public climate. Having said that, to advert back to the previous question, I don't favour another Royal Commission and round of discussion to gather the evidence. I think we've got all the evidence we need. We've amassed that over the years. I think the issue for us now, and I tried to lay it out this morning and repeat it again at the start of this, is we need a process for action. 
And frankly, I need a mandate, and we've got a chance in September, to get the numbers to lead this government to make those changes. It's as simple as that. More talk will be more inertia. We need political action and we need a political mandate for those who are prepared to make change. So do you not support the idea of a deliberative democracy, um, as introduced earlier by Alison R uh, Ritter, perhaps in, I don't know, the form of a road show, oh, like we saw with the public broadcasting one recently, no, or the flag be, debate? Absolutely should be doing that. But if you're saying, should we now start a public debate on drug law reform, we've been having that debate for a long time. All I'm saying, and I thought this was the mood of the discussion earlier, was that we need to make progress. Initiating a further round of sort of ground-up discussion won't do that. The lesson of the Psychoactive Substances Act, the big one, and where we failed, I think, is absolutely exactly that sort of iterative process of what this means, how it works, what the implications are, when it's going to take effect. That does need to accompany any major change. Otherwise, we'll end up in precisely the same situation we did then. Can I, can I suggest you could you could also split the issue? So you know, I, I strongly favour legalisation of cannabis, at least mid pot, if not the full legalisation. And then you have you use something like the deliberative de democratic process, which is fantastic, um, to work with the community on what the shape of a commercial market might look like, what other kinds of regulations might be required. You know, so you do still engage in the conversation, but you just you can't, as legislators, be allowed to let. Um, the harm that is happening right now continue uh, unabated. So I think there's an urgency in the decriminalisation and the Law Commission model for other drugs, legalisation for cannabis, and then a community engagement and conversation about what to, well, how to then form the policy. That would be my preferred approach. Uh, okay, can I have a time check? Uh, we have we, half an hour left. Um, I suspect that with this particular audience there will be many of you um, very much engaged and ready to ask questions. Can I just see a show of hands? Who's ready with a question? Because um, that'll give me an idea. Is that it? Really? Come now. I know nobody likes to be first, but... Um, we might, is it okay, Ross, if we start on some questions from the floor and I can pick it up after that if necessary. We've got microphones going around. Um, as I've asked the politicians, please hold it up close to your, um, ha to your mouth, otherwise we won't be able to hear you properly. I'm going to start here. Please let us know if you're uh, directing this to any particular person. Kia ora, I'm Marilyn from the New Zealand Nurses Organisation and I am directing my question to um, Peter, but I'm sure everybody else um, would be interested. New Zealand Nurse Organisation was one of the few organisations that didn't fully support the, it was not really um, particularly um, pleased with the national drug policy, not because of what it had in it, but because of what it emitted. And I still see an emphasis on that drug policy and in most of the conversation today on illegal drugs. And I think um, you are the only one um, to speak of, um, sorry, um, David Clark was the only one, to, um, to speak of legal drugs as well. The reality is, all, you know, the drug policy is very firmly focused on gangs, etc., and, uh, you know, a particular sector of the population, but actually most illegal drugs are consumed by the middle class and, and a pathway to... Um, you know, to, to um, drug addiction is, is through prescription drugs. That's what our members tell us, that there is a, an enormous issue with prescription drugs that is just not even in the conversation. So that's my question to you. How will you address that? Well, the national drug policy is an overarching piece of work, so it does include all drugs, but obviously the emphasis has been on, as you say, the traditionally illegal drugs, but equally there's a strong emphasis on alcohol. I think the area of prescription drugs is one that frankly is a, it's creeping up on us in quite a dramatic way. Uh, we perhaps haven't put the focus on it that we should. I think it is a real issue, and I think it is probably something that comes into the ongoing development of the policy work in this area. But the reality has been, if you just look at the priorities that have been before Parliament in recent years, we had the I think it was in 2012, from memory, the, the new sale of the, uh, the sale of liquor legislation, and a lot of big changes were made there. 
and then the national drug policy which came along in 2015 and had been worked on for a couple of years leading to its um, final development. That's set an overarching framework. I think none of these things stay set in stone forever. We've already started looking at what the next phase of that work needs to look like and I think the issue of, if you like, um, well, prescription drugs but also a range of other um, preparations that, that are in the legal space that can have adverse impacts probably do need to be factored in as part of that discussion. Does anybody else want to address that? No? Okay. Let's take another here. Oh, kia ora. My name is Aaron. Um, I'm a Māori drug and alcohol counsellor from up in Auckland and with uh, Racial Equity Aotearoa. Um, given that 40% of our prison population are incarcerated for minor drug offences and 51% uh, of our prison population are, are Māori whānau, do you think our current drug policy and legislation perpetuates institutional racism? I think it's 56% now. Can I, can I respond quickly to that? One of the actions that I alluded to earlier this morning as part of the national drug policy, which is getting underway uh, pretty imminently, is a review of the minor penalties regime as it's applied under the Misuse of Drugs Act. So the question as to whether we're actually wasting resources um, dealing with people in the way that you know, you've described uh, and what a more appropriate way is, is actually on the agenda I'm expecting to get recommendations on that probably later this year, early next year. Again, that will then feed in to the refresh of the Misuse of Drugs Act over the next two years. Does it do, does it, does it uh, institutionalise racism? I think the answer is simply provided for in the fact that Māori are grossly overrepresented in our prison population. And I think that uh, this is just another sad proof of that statistic. And you could argue very strongly and with, I think with some persuasion that the whole system in that sense uh, institutionalises racism. Yes. Um, can I, can I, this is something that hasn't kind of fully been canvassed yet and I suspect other panel members will have a view, but uh, one of the obvious things is that so much uh, of the problem that we have, I think, can be attributed to under-resourcing of those sectors who want to help people with addictions um, and mental health issues. And, um, you know, I heard a constituent I met on the weekend was telling me about her brother who'd been through a Salvation Army program, successfully rehabilitated for a number of years, uh, then had a relapse, went back to the same program. Its funding had been cut. The service offered was a more bare bones service, and he really struggled. After he left, there was another funding cut for the program. It is a successful program, and this is, you know, by no means unique to my electorate. It is across the country. We know that there's been a 60% increase in the number of people accessing mental health services alone, and that funding ha in the past decade, and that funding has gone up by less than half of that. We have a growing number of people in our population wrestling with mental health and addictions, and we are not, we simply are not devoting the resources to addressing those, and it's permeating inequalities in so our society. So the assumption is that funding, extra funding, could come from full legalisation and regulation of a market? Well, no, I was talking about support for addictions uh, in this instance, um, but, but I mean, um, we could push forward with um, reform. There's no, there's, I don't think funding is the thing that's stopping reform happening, uh, personally. Uh, I might be wrong, I might be, be corrected on that, but but I'm talking about, in this instance, supporting those who are seeking help, and the support for those people is just not there currently. Um, I'd just like to address the bit about uh, does this law perpetuate institutionalised racism? I think the lack of willingness in this country to speak to Del Māori and acknowledge culture, language and identity of its indigenous people perpetuates institutionalised racism and that the application of the law or the implementation of the policing of the law um, is, uh, is skewed because the system is inherently racist and every time you say that people get very upset with those words but it is and we have to address it and so uh, I don't think the law perpetuates it per se, it's the implementation and the policing and the general um, attitude in, in our nation around Māori and Pacifica uh, criminality. I think we should be putting, uh, directing people to, I say it, the, that's, I don't believe that, that we have an issue with criminality, just saying. Um, I think that's the perception in this country. I think we should be directing people who are caught 
for minor drug offences straight to um, treatment and we need to have more treatment available. And that treatment, uh, as you do, thank you very much for the efforts you make on behalf of our people in this country, but we need more like you and they need to be culturally sensitive. David? Oh, look, if you, if you have a law that is infrequently enforced and, of course, all of the prejudices you'd expect will come out through the arbitrariness and you can't go past the story of the two Kellys. Kelly Van Garlen supplies medical marijuana, gets detected and is arrested. Uh, Helen Kelly proactively advertises to the media that she's breaking the law and nothing happens. One is a Maori woman in the far north, the other is a middle class woman in Wellington. And there you have it in a nutshell. The answer to your question is yes. The legal system has racist filters. That means that Māori are more likely to be stopped by the police, arrested by the police, and convicted and jailed for the same crimes as Pākehās, particularly male men, particularly young male men, and for cannabis crimes. The Christchurch study showed that very clearly. And so we, we have to address the racism in the legal system that is perpetuated by the law, which, in my view, can't be justified in any event, and is then implemented in a way uh, that imposes a huge burden on Māori whānau. And the consequences are enormous. We're taking men, often in, in one example that you've given, we're taking them out of their whānau. So what does that mean for them and their income for that whānau? What does that mean for their, their kids who have to go and visit their dad in jail for no reason other than they smoke pot? This is the reason why we have to act urgently. This is not just about some intellectual exercise about you know, some cohort of people. Families every day are suffering from the effects of this. It is grossly unfair and it affects Māori even more because the law is used in such a racist way. That is what we're facing in this country. I do need to point out that you will have uh, observed in your agenda for these two days that we will be looking at the issue through a Māori filter for the entire morning, tomorrow morning. Um, so we'll pick that up again then. Uh, there was a question down there at the side, yes? Sorry? Oh, okay, cool. Um, let's go this side then. Uh, yes, madam, yeah. Hi, um, I'm a refugee from the United States, and um, welcome, <laughs> kia ora. I'm uh, also an addiction medicine physician, and what I've heard here, um, and I'm sorry, as part of that, I'm a so-called expert, and I'm sorry, but I did take a little bit of offense to that statement. Um, and I have heard a distinct lack of input from those of us who deal with this problem every single day. 30, 20 or 30 times a day, every single day, I deal with people who are coming to me because they have this problem. And I haven't heard that there was any input in any of these groups from addiction medicine physicians. I mean, I don't, these people, whether it's legal or illegal, doesn't matter to me. I don't care if the drugs are legal or illegal. What I care about is what effect is this having on the person in front of me and what does the science say? I do you do, have a question? Sorry, yeah, do you have I a question? Do, I do have one question about how do you prevent the perception that when you give something, when you legalize something as a medicine, that gives the perception that it is somehow safe. And that's my concern. That's what's happened across the United States when things got medicinal. The rates of use went way up because people thought, oh, well, it's safe, it's a medicine. So how do you prevent that perception? I mean, I think we have to be practical. Uh, most medicines are not safe if you are using them wrongly. The opiates that people get prescribed are not safe, uh, if used wrongly or outside of their prescription. So I think that's part of the just having that straight conversation. Um, I would say, though, just in terms of the services, because we haven't talked about that yet, 75% of government's um, drug-related spending is on enforcement. 
So we are spending a, a gross amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars, on enforcing prohibition and not on the addiction services, the support services for Fano, who need it the most. And I think that is another, uh, you know, we need to fix that. We can fix that too. Can I pick that up, actually, with you for a moment, Peter, if you don't mind? Um, you said in your opening address that police and customs have made great progress um, in recent years, and, and I personally think that the statistics on um, the supply of meth in this country don't support that. Um, we also know uh, from looking at what's happening in the United States right now that um, with the situation around opioids that it is almost impossible right, to stop the flow of newer and newer substances. Um, so how do we build that into the equation? C can I answer that and also the question that was raised? Certainly. I think to answer your question specifically, I think that, that is why we need to work on an evidence-based product schedule. So in other words, the products need to go through the testing process, they need to, the, the toxicity, the manufacturing standard needs to be identified. It's not just a case of saying, I'll just grow my own in the backyard and all will be well. I think we've got to be very strict about that for precisely the reasons you set out. Come back to, to your point, Alison. Um, methamphetamine seizures across the border are increasing dramatically because of the changes that were made some years ago regarding precursor supply in New Zealand, the, the, the pseudoephedrine um, situation. What we are seeing is, however, a, a dramatic increase in just the volume that's coming our way, and, and you've seen some remarkably big seizures in the last couple of years. What we're also seeing, if, if you come back to, the, to, the, to the, um, the new psychoactive substances market, there are about 600 different products around the world. Now, we're insulated to some extent by our location, uh, but we are part of the early warning system that applies internationally, where this stuff's been trafficked across national borders in Europe, particularly much more freely. We're insulated from that to a very large extent in New Zealand. Uh, but we cannot be complacent because, as you say, this industry is not in its death throes. It's, it's developing new ways, new mechanisms, new tactics for getting stuff in all of the time. The only way an island nation like New Zealand can cope is to be vigilant in terms of its international uh, connections and from, from I don't mean in the sinister sense intelligence, but drug intelligence world to know what's happening and also be prepared to, to strike when it can. I know the police do a lot of work here with undercover operations about big suppliers. Now, that's one side of the ledger that's quite separate from, if you like, the individual user, the, um, the, 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 the person who needs help, um, and so on and so forth. But both sides of the ledger are important in this. And I think within the resources available to New Zealand because of our size and situation, we're doing a pretty good job, but we're fighting, as every country is, virtually an uphill battle all the time. Let's go. Can, can I just take one from this end? Because we haven't been down here yet. Uh, can I take you, madam, in the back there? Just wait, yes, you. Just wait for the microphone. Um, hi, can everyone hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm Fiona Hutton from Victoria University. I'm a lecturer in criminology. And I guess any of the panel really could answer my question. Um, oh, sorry, hold it there, yep, is that right? Leave it there. Okay, sorry, thanks. And I guess any of the panel could answer my question. And I would like to thank them for being here today for what is a very politically charged topic. And this leads me really, I guess, to my question. Um, there's been a phrase that's been bandied around today, which I think is a really important and key phrase that I've heard several of the politicians say, and that is, if there is the political will. And this concerns me because of something that one of our speakers from the States said, avoid the conservative hardliners. You're banging your head against a brick wall. So what happens then if the conservative hardliner is our prime minister, who has publicly stated that he is not interested in decriminalization, he's not interested in drug law reform. And I look around this room and I see all of the wonderful people here from all different areas, from community groups to academics to addiction specialists and so on. 
where all the shelves of libraries, people's offices around the world are groaning with evidence that the path we are taking is not working. It is causing harm <laughs> in our communities. So why are politicians so blind to the evidence why will people like Bill English in the face of this evidence? And why do people who talk about evidence-based policy refuse to look and discuss the evidence? Chris, I'm going to have to get you to address that first, please. <laughs> well, I'll just, I just make the point which I, I made before about 20 minutes ago, which is that it's not enough just to have 250 people here who all agree. You know, if we polled this room, I, I know what the outcome would be. That's great, but you don't get to decide. Two and a half or 2.8 million New Zealanders get to decide and elect a parliament. And uh, my point is the point I made before, which is that you've got to take the people with you. So, oh, can, I, can I fill in on that? What I'd, what I'd say to you, ma'am, is that on the 23rd of August is the last day that the Electoral Commission will take nominations for the election. And... I'm on side with this, I've told you what my views are, but Chris is right, people do have legitimate fears and the answer can't be, you're all idiots who don't understand evidence-based policy and I'm gonna show leadership. So, yep, totally agree and for what it's worth, I think you have gotta be strategic about social change. If you look at all the big social changes in New Zealand, you look at homosexual law reform, they didn't say we want gay marriage in 1986, uh, but it happened over time and now there's absolutely no question that they would ever be reversed. Uh, I think that you know, the opportunity of what other countries are doing over the next couple of years is huge uh, because it's an opportunity to allay the fears that people have and those fears are real and they have to be respected. Di, isn't it important that we have the leadership at this point though? Because uh, we know the Prime Minister would have voted differently now on same-sex marriage. That doesn't actually make yeah. me feel any better about that. Yeah. Uh, so, sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> Some, sometimes the political, the political realm, sometimes government or the political realm leads and sometimes it follows. And that, you know, that's, those are the decisions we make. We are here to do what's right, even if it's hard. And sometimes that means leading on an issue and bringing the community with us. We did that with civil unions. I, don't, I was here, me and Peter were here. The civil unions, it was awful for those of you who are involved in that. It was the most awful process and the most um, oh, homophobic, terrible process that we all went through. We got it done. A few years later, we got to marriage equality because people had gotten over it, but we led the country on getting to marriage equality through the civil union process. And we need to lead on this too. We know what needs to be done. We know we can engage the community. We know the sky isn't gonna fall in. We've got these great examples from all around the world that actually it can work. So sometimes politicians just have to stand up and take the hit and do what's right, even if it's hard. I, um, David. Yep, I, I mean, I agree entirely um, with your sentiment and I think people should look clearly at the policies that are on offer. I mean, we have been really clear over time that we see a clear path laid out in this document. And I think if you've got a side uh, that's, that's conservative and clear that it's not gonna have reform and one that says there's a path to reform laid out and we're gonna follow it, um, the choice is actually pretty plain. Sorry. And people should go can to I the ballot boxes and exercise their vote. Can I just interrupt there? I mean, that, like, that's, that's very nice and good, David, but this government, took a pretty progressive move actually in 2012 and 13 with the psychoactive substances regime. So to your point before about we don't do the evidence and blah, 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 we, we took a pretty progressive and pretty, pretty ambitious policy uh, uh, into 2013-14 uh, and we enacted it. And then it was actually the Labour Party that came out and campaigned against that uh, in response to public pressure. So that's, that's my point before, you've got to take the public with you and politicians will respond to political incentives. And the Labour Party went up and down the country standing outside uh, people, uh, dairies and, and shops that sell psychoactive substances and campaigned against it and forced retreat on that issue. So, like it's all very well to say just to point at the Law Commission report and say, we'll do this in government, 
and it's all very well for Materia to say we're going to legalise cannabis. Materia has been in Parliament since 2002. Guess how many years she's had a medicinal cannabis legalisation bill in the ballot? Not very many. And on the point of principled leadership, the day the Green Party puts an abortion law reform bill in, then I'll believe them on leadership on the tough issues. Can I, can I just make this point? that I have been at the forefront of every... I'm interested in the we comment, because I've actually led every reform that's been made in the last nine years, and there have been more changes made in the last nine years than in any time since the Misuse of Drug Act was passed in 1975. So if you just want to talk about leadership, just look at the example that's sitting in front of you. Peter, are you concerned then, and this may be a bit awkward, are you concerned then by the attitude that the Prime Minister has recently shown? Well, the Prime Minister is perfectly entitled to his view. I have mine. Uh, we're from different parties. That's, I suspect, one reason why. Um, but I work with him, and uh, I was interested to note that on, when was it, Monday morning, he made reasonably sympathetic comments towards a drug testing outside music festivals, which I think is progressive, and I think that's good, and we'll continue the conversation. Right, thank you. Um, can great, I just add question. a little bit to this conversation, because I agree with Peter, right, that actually the Prime Minister is completely entitled to his opinion. We are representatives of the people. There are people in this country who are of the same opinion as he is, and we have an opportunity to come to this place post-election, and if you want a change of leadership because you don't think it's the right thing, well, then you have the opportunity to do that on the 23rd of September. That's what democracy is. But we are representatives of our people, and so we bring our experiences to the House as well. So I know in my town, marijuana has been a huge hindrance to motivation, to getting people into higher employment, to staying at school, and on and on and on. There is not a harmless thing. And so we bring our experiences to the table to have the conversation and make the right decisions based on what our people say. And this is what they're saying. But we're not just um, chucking kids in prison or young people. We're excluding them from school now. They are, they are drug testing them at the doorway when they enrol at high school, Colenso College, I'm going to name and shame them right now, are doing that. For, j j I did, I don't even care. Because they are excluding our kids from school by drug testing them on the way in, not dealing with the harm and the health and the safety and the whanau or anything. And they just, here's a pathway straight to what? To incarceration eventually because you now don't go to school? Kia ora. That was a very good question, I, as I can um, tell by the response. You had a question? Yeah. Um, Kia ora, people. I, I represent New Zealand People um, and Red Door Recovery. Um, both organisations started because we couldn't get loved ones help. Um, I'm an alcohol and drug clinician. I have been for a few years now. Um, what, what, what concerns me the most is there's been a lot of talk about... Um, the, the drug courts and doing great things and, and getting people help, but what I want to know is if we can't get our people help and we're the professionals giving help, we, we, when's the help going to come? What's your major constraint? Funding. I mean, oh, I've, I've taken two days off to come here, but I will pay for that Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You know, my, my phone is in my pocket on Vibrate, and it's, it's going off. I'd, Funding. I'd like to talk to that again. Um, look, we, the Labor Party commissioned an independent report from Infometrics to look at the Treasury data and to assess what the but amount once of again, money you're looking. would be needed, what amount of money would be needed in order to retain existing services in the health system. And the estimate of the shortfall over the last nine years is $2.3 billion, which is no small bear. So there has been a huge amount of money taken out of the health system. Mental health and addictions is often the poor cousin. It's the first to miss out on that funding. And so we have seen our systems, our support, systematically downgraded. And that is a fundamental thing which I think is going wrong right now. We have said as an election pledge that we will meet costs rising in the health sector and we will return that shortfall over time, the 2.3 billion. We won't be giving tax cuts for you know, if you're buying a second Maserati, um, don't count on the Labor Party to give you a tax cut. 
It isn't going to happen at that end of the uh, spectrum. But we will prioritise putting money back into the health system. I need to go because I've got a question in the House on uh, oral, uh, sorry, on mental health and addictions and also general debate speech I need to prepare. So my apologies for leaving a little early um, and thank you for that opportunity thank to you. say something Does on that. Does anybody else want to... Yeah, I, I know people with only one Maserati who want a tax cut. That's not true at all. Yeah, that was funny. Uh, <laughs> oh, David, don't go. I was just going to say, you know what, 150 years of red and blue and we're still in the same place. So it's not all one-way traffic and the shortfall of the last nine years. Uh, under the Labour Party, they broke up Māori Affairs and mainstreamed all those services where we could have had direct access uh, to support our sector and the NGOs. So, I mean, we're here now. <laughs> We're having the conversation and we have to move forward. And I want to commend Peter Dunn for leading uh, all of the reform that's happened in the last nine years. But we need to keep going. We know that. But this, is, this conversation is good. And I'm, I've heard you say there's an, people say there's enough evidence, just do it. But we've seen what happens when we just do things. Uh, the people don't come with you and that's been well made. We have to have the country acknowledge where we're at and move forward together. Last comments? Um, we're a country spending around $350 million a year on enforcement. Uh, even a fraction of that, even $100 million, a fraction of that, going to addiction services, support services, would be a massive boost. We have 2,000 New Zealanders who are going to have to wait longer than three weeks to get into any treatment, which for addiction is a lifetime. Uh, there's a th nearly 1,000 who will have to wait longer than eight weeks to get any kind, of a treatment, any kind of treatment, and lives get lost in that period of time if we don't act. So we need some urgent investment into the services. Who will save people's lives? We know that will happen. We will save people's lives. But, I mean, we just can't be spending that kind of money on, on enforcement of a unnecessary law where we know people need it to be able to be well. Kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, we're at lunchtime, so we're going to cut it off there. There will be... There will be an opportunity, of course, to ask questions throughout the rest of the, the one and a half days that's left. And don't forget, write your questions down if I didn't get to you on that card that will be distributed at lunchtime. And if it's good enough, I'll rip it off the board and I will make sure it's asked. Um, just to sum that session up, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, to sum it up from a media point of view, um, very quickly, I think that we can expect that all parties, I can't talk for New Zealand first because they weren't here, um, are open to uh, any kind of inquiry in the lead up to the election about the issues that we're talking about here today. Uh, and that we can expect some kind of law reform in the next two to three years. Fair? That's what I heard anyway. Thank you so much. Uh, to Peter Dunn, to Chris Bishop, to David Seymour, Marama Fox, David Clark and Metiria Turei.